This is the Concealed Carry Podcast, Season 6, Episode 12. And welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, part of the ConcealedCarry.com network, brought to you by Mountain Man Medical. Today is Wednesday, June 1st, 2022, as of the recording of this episode, and I am your host, Riley Bowman. Today, joined by a special guest whom I will bring on and introduce here momentarily, and that guest is Dave Kobel. I'm looking forward to our discussion here today, uh, talking about how often armed citizens defend themselves. But first, before we get to, to Dave and to that topic, today's episode is sponsored by CCW Safe. You know, I just spent the weekend actually with uh, CCW Safe in Houston, Texas at the NRA annual meetings and exhibits, and we had a great time together. Uh, one of the things that has inspired us to work to, so closely together with CCW Safe is because of the type of people that they are and the values they represent, which happen to align with our values. If you're looking for some of the best, not only the best coverage, but the best people to back you up in the event that you have to use a gun in self-defense, which happens to be the topic of our discussion here today, I would encourage you to take a look at CCW Safe. We'll be there for you and in your time of need to uh, help you through that, not only with the legal costs associated with that, but also they're just good people. They're going to be on the phone with you, talking with you, helping you through this because it is an ordeal if you have to go through that. So check out ccwsafe.com today. Also, today's episode is sponsored by the 2022 Guardian Conference in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. That's September 16th to the 18th. This is our three-day training event where we'll be bringing in the world-class instructors to teach the finest Americans how to properly and safely and legally defend themselves from violent attacks. It'll be shooting courses, hand-to-hand -hand combative courses, legal courses, non-lethal option courses as well presented over those three days. We hope that you will join us there in Oklahoma City. Again, September 16th to the 18th. Tickets are going, so please sign up today. Go to guardianconference.com to learn more. I do want to just make a little side mention there that ammunition is available for that event through our, our ammunition supplier, Mountain City Supply. MountainCitySupply.com is where you can find the fine folks at Mountain City Supply. Uh, you can purchase ammunition in advance. They are working on getting a special page or something dedicated for that purpose, which we will put out there as soon as it's available. But in the meantime, just know there will be ammunition available, and you could probably also count on buying ammo on site when you arrive. They should have enough with them. At least that's the intent. So check out mountaincitysupply.com. Mark's asking on Facebook, when do we need to purchase ammo for the event? Well, as soon as we get that, uh, that special page or link set up for you guys, for you attendees, uh, we'll make sure we get that out there. You'll have plenty of time to uh, get your ammunition secured. And again, Mark, chances are, uh, you'd be able to pick it up on site as well or, or buy it on site. You will be picking it up on site, that's for sure, uh, no matter what you do. So, all right, let's get into today's topic of discussion with our special guest. I'm going to bring him on now, Mr. Dave Copel. It's Copel, right? All right. Oh, and I failed on the unmute. I thought I hit it. I did not. There we go. All right. There you are. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you doing this. I know you're a busy man. Uh, you're probably used to being on much fancier shows on TV and whatnot for various interviews. Here, here you are on our humble podcast, the Concealed Carry Podcast. But uh, you know, something that we've uh, noted about you for some time is uh, you, you have a, a unique way of breaking down intricate uh, issues and details, you know, surrounding the Second Amendment. And so we've been. Uh, Really excited to have you on to uh, talk with us specifically today, and amongst other things, probably the the idea of how often do armed citizens defend themselves, which is an article published on America's First Freedom org a little less than a month ago, May fourth, twenty twenty two, breaking down some some statistics and various uh, studies or polls done surrounding this topic. So actually, I, I wanted to start first, though, Dave. Would you mind giving us a brief uh, spiel, if you will, on kind of who you are and what your background is, and also why you're so passionate about these subjects. Sure. I'm the, uh, um, I'm a lawyer. I'm the research director at the Independence Institute, which is a think tank in Denver, and is the uh, the second oldest state level 
think tank. I'm also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., which is uh, well, the world's premier uh, libertarian think tank. And besides that, I'm an adjunct law professor at the University of Denver, uh, where I teach a, a variety of courses in uh, constitutional law, in, including one on the Second Amendment. And I, I guess uh, the, the reason I'm involved in this issue is I think it is the, uh, the pro-life uh, side of, of, of the question in the long run, that arms in the hands of responsible citizens uh, enhance public safety. And conversely, of course, arms in the hands of irresponsible people are very dangerous to public safety. So what I try to do in my career is promote the laws that uh, promote public safety in both ways by uh, encouraging and allowing responsible citizens to have arms and by discouraging or, dis or disarming uh, the irresponsible ones. That's awesome. Um, and certainly is right up our alley here. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we started the Concealed Carry podcast in the very beginning was we wanted to reach, uh, teach, and inspire good citizens to be able to uh, defend themselves and those that they care about um, properly and adequately. And we believe that that's something that does happen quite frequently, which uh, your article uh, discusses here. Yes. And so. Uh, what what are some of the things that, I mean, there's been a number of polls or studies that have been uh, put together throughout the years. Uh, there has been commonly thought for some time uh, amongst the, especially the firearm circles that roughly a million or so uh, defensive gun uses are, you know, occur each year across America. Uh, and, and according to mo the most recent one, according to your article here is about 1.6 million times. Right. Which is quite a bit more actually than even a million talking to some of the more conservative people out there, particularly those that might have an agenda against such things. So it looks like we, we lost uh, Dave there. I'm sure we'll get him right back here. Um, folks, I'm going to point you to an article. In fact, I'm going to drop the link in the show notes and drop it in the chat for all those of you joining us on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, this is a great article, like I said, that, that we're referencing here from Dave. And you can go check that out in your spare time. So maybe we'll get him back. <laughs> That's how it goes sometimes with technology, right? Um, I see that, Mark, your question about is he an attorney, that you probably got that answer. So I uh, won't feel like we won't have to answer that again, right? Um. Guys, so I'm going to go over a couple things here from the article. So according to his article, he says the most recent, according to the most recent study, about 1.6 million times annually, uh, about a th and it says over the lifetime, about a third of gun owners will use a firearm defensively at least once. I think we got Dave back here, bringing him yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for those uh, technical difficulties. You were uh, just describing the national survey uh, conducted by Professor William English at Georgetown, and that's sort of our our latest. Uh, data point on on defensive gun use. Uh, but I think you were asking before about the, the polls. Um, this was something that uh, sort of general purpose pollsters, uh, like the Field Poll in California or the Gallup Poll or and, and other you know national companies like that, uh, started asking about, I believe in the, in the late 1970s. And you know they asked the question in different ways, have you ever in your life in the last five years, in the past year, and you got results um, from about 700,000 annual defensive gun uses up to several million uh, defensive gun uses, and that that's where uh, things stood when uh, Gary Kleck, uh, Florida State University professor, uh, came in with the most sophisticated uh, national study of the topic to that point. Yeah. Uh, so t tell us a little bit about the uh, the Kleck study. You're referring to the 1993 one, I take it. it exactly. And it, what uh, Kleck did was look at all the previous, and Kleck is a uh, professor of criminology at Florida State University. Uh, actually, a book he uh, 
published in, in uh, 1991 uh, called Point Blank, which consolidated and analyzed all the social science data about arms in the United States, uh, won the highest award in, um, from the American Society of Criminology, the, uh, the Hindelang Prize. Um, and so Clack was very interested in defensive gun use and looked at all these previous polls and, you know, thought they were a, a good start, but wanted to do something that was much more methodologically uh, sophisticated. So it wasn't just a one or two question thing. Uh, people would get asked multiple uh, questions and, and they were, the questions were also structured in a way so as to uh, weed out uh, people who just might make up some story about uh, defensive gun use. You know, it's one thing to say yes or no, have you ever used a gun defensively versus uh, being able to plausibly supply details. And by the way, what, here's, here's one very important thing. Um, when we talk about defensive gun use, we are usually, and the, the, the number of that annually in the United States, we are usually not talking about somebody who's pulling the trigger. Uh, the CLEC mm -hmm. survey and the other ones that have gone into this kind of depth have found that at, at least 80% of the time, um, the uh, defender doesn't have to pull the trigger. The mer merely uh, displaying the gun or, or even referring to it as in, you should leave now because I have a gun, um, you know, ending a uh, encounter in a, a parking lot, for example, um, that usually uh, suffices uh, to uh, end the potential uh, or, or imminent attack. Anyway, right. so, so Clack went at this in uh, great depth with a national uh, telephone survey, and he came up with a midpoint estimate of about 2.5 million uh, defensive gun uses annually. Um, and that was published in a uh, uh, issue of the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology. Uh, that that's one of the law journals published by uh, Northwestern University, one of the top law schools in the United States. And that issue also uh, featured some uh, follow-up articles by other people who were commenting on Kleck's piece. And one of them was written by Marvin Wolfgang. Now, uh, Marvin Wolfgang uh, may not be famous to the uh, uh, the podcast audience. Uh, but that's because the podcast audience is not composed mainly of, of criminology professors. Uh, Marvin Wolfgang is the top criminal, by citations at least, uh, the top most cited criminology professor in the English-speaking world. And among his many other accomplishments, he was a, a past president of the American Society of Criminology. And in his article uh, responding to Kleck, he said, uh, I hate guns. If I had my way, I would disarm all of the citizens and maybe the police too. Um, so he, he wasn't coming at it from a, a pro-gun bias. And he said, I, I'm uh, not happy about this CLEC study, which shows that, that guns can be useful. But he said, nevertheless, um, they have done an outstanding job in meeting any all potential objections in advance, in having a very sound and rigorous methodology, and uh, I, I commend them uh, for their work. Much as he much as he didn't like it, he thought it was an outstanding article that that uh, very persuasively proved its point. Yeah, I was just going to mention because uh, you touched on it just a, a moment ago, but even referencing to. Uh, uh, William English's most recent study, uh, you were you were mentioning about eighty percent of DGUs or defensive gun uses uh, don't result in any shots being fired, and, and according to his study, it was uh, eighty one point nine percent. I remember breaking this down in a recent uh, podcast episode we did, where I actually highlighted the, the English study from Georgetown University, which we thought was was pretty eye opening in a lot of respects. Um, when we look at the study that Cleck did, that was uh, so well regarded and also produced a pretty astonishing result in that 
estimate of 2.5 million DGUs, which is substantially higher than pretty much anything else um, that had been done previously or even probably since, at least. Well, so some, some of that's in line with uh, some of the uh, more generic opinion polling uh, that mm -hmm. had been done. There was a pretty wide range of, and CLEC was, was within that, not at the high end. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, looking at, you know, things, you know, the world in 1993, uh, which was a different world than 2022, uh, what would you say is different between now and then as, you know, comparing this most recent study uh, from English and CLEC's own study of nearly 30 years ago? Well, an, an important thing is, is CLEC was studying conditions as they existed in the early 1990s in the United States. And that was a very high crime period. Um, after the early 1990s, uh, crime began to fall uh, quite substantially. Um, and for example, uh, gun crime and gun homicide fell by over half. Uh, and that was a very happy condition that, that continued until about 2015, um, when for a variety of reasons, of which I would include the uh, uh, whole war on the police and defund the police and, and those kinds of things, uh, crime rates began rising again, and then uh, they've risen substantially as of 2022. But anyway, the difference between, say, the English study uh, of the, the past several years, um, where, where crime even then wasn't as bad as it, as it is this year, versus sure. Cleck, is he's is English is measuring a lower crime period. And Cleck has always said, that you would expect offensive gun use to rise and fall at approximately the same level as the overall violent crime rate. Mm. Um, so it, it, it's no surprise that Kleck's study of the early 90s um, has more defensive gun uses than English's more recent uh, work. Yeah, it's a very, very, very valid point. Uh, and that's kind of what I was getting at, too, is that it's, it's a different world. Uh, it's interesting, too, seeing the more recent um, movement to, to, as you said, defund police and kind of this uh, dislike, distaste, dis disrespect, I guess, toward the police. Uh, there's there's consequences that come along with an attitude like that that becomes popularized, isn't there? Well, um, among other things, it makes the police much more passive. Yeah. So, that, you know, we, we know that among the, the various demographic groups, uh, the group that gets victimized by violent crime the most tends to be black people uh, who live in inner cities and the vast majority of the victimization of them is by other black people. And so when you have proactive policing that says, oh, you know, it's uh, two o'clock on a uh, Thursday night and there's a bunch of uh, young males uh, hanging out in a parking lot someplace um, before uh, the war on the police, it would be fairly common uh, for law enforcement officers to go up to them and inquire what's going on. And, you know, maybe, maybe they're just outside drinking beer and having a good time, or maybe they're getting ready to do a robbery. Uh, and when you don't, and when you act proactively, to at least investigate something that could be suspicious. That's one of the things that really helped bring down violent crime rates. And of course, another thing that brings down violent crime rates is putting violent criminals in prison. And that's actually an important difference between uh, violent crime enforcement versus say, drug law enforcement. Mm. Illegal drugs, people go into the business of selling illegal drugs because they can make substantial money on it you know, especially at the level above, uh, you know, the, the distributor on the street. So if you uh, arrest some uh, people involved in a drug distribution gang, you put them in prison, there's still going to be that customer demand for drugs. So it's likely that the gang you put in prison for selling drugs is going to be fairly readily replaced by some other gang uh, that wants to make the money. In contrast, there's no demand uh, on the consumption side uh, 
for violent crime. People aren't saying, oh, I wish I'm walking down the street. I wish somebody would mug me. Um, <laughs> so when you take the mugger off the street, then you have one less mugger in the city and muggings will fall by that amount. You know, you, you take a take 500 muggers off the street, you can really substantially reduce the mugging rate because we actually know that uh, the large majority of violent crime is is perpetrated by a fairly small number uh, of criminals. You know, it's not exactly the 80-20 rule, but it, it's it's that kind of uh, principle. And, but yeah. then when you have what I think are, are some, and I'm, I'm very much in favor of constitutional due process for everyone and generally against mandatory sentences uh, for anything, because I think mandatory sentences take away the discretion that, that judges should have uh, in setting a sentence appropriate for the particular criminal and the particular crime. But when you, you do things like, uh, say, everyone who gets arrested uh, is, makes it very easy for them to get out on bail, you know, we've seen those kind of problems in New York City where people just get get arrested in the morning uh, and they're back out on the streets committing committing more crimes in the afternoon. You know, even in, in Boulder, Colorado, uh, you know, you, I've heard legislative testimony uh, from storekeepers on the Pearl Street Mall in Boulder, you know, very open, common public space is they just have people come in, uh, take stuff you know, not even surreptitious shoplifting, take stuff and you tell them not to, and that they'll pull out some big knife. And so you call the cops, they get arrested. And as the uh, thieves warned, they're back on the streets and, and maybe back in that same store, you know, hours later. Yeah. So of, of course, you're going to have rise in crime in, in that kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very, very good uh, points there. And it, we've certainly seen the results of that through this whole uh, couple of years of COVID, uh, especially with not only uh, anti-police type movements, but just a COVID related policy of catch and release or, or even letting people out uh, early from sentences uh, because, well, you know, can't have them in the jails all in close contact getting COVID. Uh, well, so, and, I, and I understand the, the, the good intentions behind that because you, yep. you don't want uh, jails to be some or prisons to be some uh, pandemic uh, breeding ground. Yeah. And if there are people who can be safely released and, you know, put on, say, home confinement, I, I think that was that was appropriate under the circumstances. The problem is when that becomes so intense that even the ones who are repeat violent and dangerous, uh, keep on getting, getting out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm referring to, uh, which we've, like I said, we've, we've seen examples of, we've seen yeah, examples absolutely. here in, in the Denver Metro area where, where I live, I've, I paid a little bit of attention to that and seen some of those reports, uh, locally. Um, so what's interesting, you know, is obviously there's, there's two sides on this whole issue as far as, you know, pro gun, anti gun, obviously. Um, what do you think, I mean, I was at the NRA convention, for instance, and, and we, uh, we had protesters outside there. I don't know if you happened to be down there or not. Um, I, I uh, taught at the Continuing Legal Education Program at the annual meeting, so I, I definitely oh, was there. Great. So, you know, I'm thinking of these uh, protesters that were across the street there and, uh, you know, throwing various uh, uh, insults our way, you know, about being baby killers and different things. Uh um, in fact, I just saw something today that someone was posting on online saying how, uh, you know, they, they, they'd love to live in a country where we loved our children more than we loved our guns. And I was thinking in response to that, knowing about how commonly people use guns in a positive way, as far as defending themselves, I'm thinking, well, one of the reasons I carry a gun with me is because I love my children. So yeah, it's, so it's an yeah. interesting dichotomy yeah. and it's, it's hard to have a conversation with that other side because that seems like a, uh, like we're not going to go anywhere with those kinds of opposing views in, in your observations. It, it's one thing to throw out statistics and these are amazing statistics to look at and we could break down them some more, but how do we reach people that maybe are not 
persuaded by statistics or don't care to even look at statistics? Well, there, I, I'd say the, the great middle of the American public mm. is interested in, in statistics. And I think already has an in, intuitive sense of what we were talking about, that guns in the right hands make you make not only the individual, but the public as a whole uh, safer and guns in the wrong hands are, are very dangerous. And so you can talk with, and, and, and that's why um, in most of the states that, that have, licensed carry, which is to say um, almost all of them uh, by this point, right. uh, there, there's strong public support for licensed carry. They think it's okay, it's fine if you, you know, you make somebody pay a reasonable fee, get fingerprinted, go through, uh, a, a pass a safety training class, and then they, they can carry a concealed handgun to protect themselves and, and their families. Um, and at the same time, those people uh, would also say, well, I'm in favor of, of laws that, you know, that that guy or woman with a concealed carry permit obviously has been uh, pretty clearly checked out uh, to very likely be a responsible person. And of course, the, the data about concealed carry revocations uh, from Colorado and elsewhere show that there's a very low rate of misbehavior of any kind by people with concealed carry permits, let alone uh, misbehavior with a, a firearm, which is very, very rare. Um, and at the same time, the people in the middle also are in favor of laws uh, to help uh, prevent dangerous people uh, from having firearms. So they would support things like red flag laws, which, which I do as well, um, as long as they have strong due process protections. But back to where your question began, mm. uh, I think there were some folks in that uh, crowd uh, demonstrating against the NRA who, who might fit into the categories we, we just talked about. And you could probably sit down with them and, and say, well, here's why we're against this particular gun control, which you think you're in favor of right now. And here are the facts and figures on it. And some of those people might change their mind. But the ones who were like out there, and this was not everybody in the crowd. But the ones who were there, for example, uh, screaming at an elderly man in a wheelchair, uh, that he was a murderer, those kinds of things. Um, the, the, the baby, the, the love children line that you quoted, and, and, and similar things, which you also hear from a lot of politicians. That's not, those aren't people who are interested in reason. They have this group hate uh, that they have invested a lot of their identity in. And part of that is uh, inventing in their mind this evil caricature of people who disagree with them. You know, th that, that's not a, a problem unique to the, the gun issue. Uh, sure. You see it in all kinds of things. And, and I would say on, on Twitter, uh, I see a lot of folks, like I try to, to call my, my Twitter feed uh, to, to make it edifying rather than uh, demoralizing. Um, but th there's a lot of folks on Twitter on either side who will have these generalizations of like, all liberals are like X, and we're, and we're all conservatives are like X, or all people who are for Trump, or all people who are against Trump. And these are really only accurate descriptions of maybe one or five percent of the group that is being criticized, but people, partly because they're sort of socially isolated and may not know, uh, for example, may not know many gun owners or any, um, they just make it up in their minds what they imagine uh, pro-civil rights people, uh, pro-Second Amendment people think. Hmm. Mark has a good question here on... Uh... Facebook. I'm going to put it out on the screen here. He says, the question is, how do we mitigate the guns in the wrong hands category? Now, you mentioned a moment ago uh, red flag laws, which has been a topic of discussion on our podcast a number of times. Uh, and, and I'm not in disagreement at all as far as like that's always been one of my major concerns with red flag laws is the due process side of it. Because um, I do sense and I, I think there's been some 
limited examples of, we've reported on a few of them where red flag laws have been abused. Yeah, um, you know, and people's due process have been violated. Um, and so how, in your mind, like if you could play King for the day and wave a magic wand and, you know, make things happen, how, how would we, you, you mentioned your own support for the idea of a red flag law. How would we implement such laws while protecting uh, individuals due process rights? Well, so I, I uh, that's, that's it. I'm glad you asked. Um, if you go to my website, davecopel.org, um, on the front page, not on the top screen, but like the, the second or third screen down is uh, some of my uh, most recent scholarship, including an article in the University of Alabama's Law and Psychology uh, Review uh, called Proceed with Caution, which is about red flag laws and goes through all the particular steps in a red flag law and uh, suggests best practices uh, for them. So for example, in uh, some states like Connecticut, anybody can go to the police and say, I'm, I'm concerned about this, this guy. Uh, I think you ought to think about red flagging him. And here's, here's why. In Connecticut, you have to have at least two police officers or one state's attorney who do their own independent verification um, of the facts and then can go into court and ask for a, uh, a red flag uh, order against an individual. In some other states, a person can, uh, and that this is the, the bad model uh, that's promoted by the, the Bloomberg lobby and, and uh, the other uh, gun ban lobbies. A person can just send a written complaint to a court and the court has to act on it, um, even uh, or or send it to law enforcement, and law enforcement has to just uh, automatically put it in the system without any checking. And then, even when there's a hearing, the per the accuser may never test might never testify. You know, you, you can't get accuracy in a courtroom without cross examination. I mean, that's one of the most fundamental things in our. Uh, American system of due process is, of course, you have witnesses, but you also have witnesses who get examined not only by one side by making an accusation, but they also get subject to cross-examination by the other side. So there's lots and lots of details about how to have a good red flag law uh, that weeds out the people who just want to write a, a poison pen letter because, uh, you know, they're a, a jilted boyfriend or, or something like that. And at the same time, gives uh, law enforcement the tools uh, to remove firearms from people who really are genuinely dangerous. Hmm. Yeah. Then, of course, there's the whole issue of if such things are going to actually be put into place, we've actually got to uh, follow through when there's legitimate concern, legitimate uh, threats yeah. in place. Right. You know, it uh, seems so often we hear of these mass shootings in recent history. Uh, there's there's a number of them where people are like, well, yeah, there was this issue and so and so, you know, took them to the to, to, you know, get help and they were reported on and and yet they some, somewhere, 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 some way, somehow somebody dropped the ball. Uh, oh, you see or, it. Or oh, oh, they didn't. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, no, over and over and over. I mean, New York has a state has a red flag law that is extremely broad. Uh, is very, very weak on due process. And so the guy who perpetrated the shooting at the supermarket in Buffalo readily could have been red flagged, you know, in, including for statements he'd made to others, you know, witnesses and in, in public about wanting to perpetrate a school shooting. So he readily could have been red flagged, which would have uh, taken away whatever firearms he had and, and prevented him from buying uh, a firearm when he did. Yeah. But that, that, but that, that's yeah. Even even without red flag laws, there are laws that allow people to be with proper evidence, and which it always should be, but allow a person to be put in a temporary uh, hold for psychiatric evaluation. And you see cases over and over of people for whom that should have been done, 
and people knew they were dangerous and they weren't. So let's just do two examples here. The, uh, the guy who, who uh, gravely wounded uh, Congresswoman Gab Gabby Giffords in Tucson and, and murdered a, a federal district judge, uh, you know, outside a, a, a supermarket, um, had been kicked out of the community college because the community college rightly said that this guy is not only nuts, he's dangerously nuts, and said you can't you're expelled from school and you can't come back uh, until you get a letter from a psychiatrist or a psychologist uh, saying you're, you're okay now. But the school, after it kicked him out, never did anything to alert the county sheriff, for example, about that. And under Arizona law, that, that guy could have been put in, under a psychiatric hold and, and maybe in, uh, you know, that might've yeah. uh, prevented that crime. Uh, same thing for the Aurora Theater shooting in uh, Aurora, Colorado in, in uh, 2012. The perpetrator uh, was a Ph.D. student at the University of Colorado uh, Medical Center in Aurora, Colorado, um, and was having very serious psychiatric problems, was talking to a psych psychiatrist at the school, and had been reported uh, to the university's threat assessment team, all quite properly. Then he dropped out of school, and the University of Colorado lost all interest in him. And again, they not a problem anymore, the sheriff. right? Yeah, uh, if, if they they knew about this guy, who they were pretty cons rightly concerned uh, was a really serious threat to be a mass shooter, um, and they knew about it. And didn't tell anyone. Yeah, yeah. That's. I think that's where I am generally, generally opposed to much in the way of new legislation, uh, because I I don't believe we can legislate these 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 problems away. I think they can have an, a, an effect to some degree, but no matter what, I mean, Mark here on Facebook commenting that. Uh, you know, we make rules and regulations and don't follow or enforce them. We're almost, we're only as good as, as we follow through on what the rules say we're supposed to do. And there's always an opportunity yeah, for, that, for, human, right, so. for the human element to, to play into that and, and have a failure somewhere simply by not reporting something that should be reported or, oh, is that, that form I'm supposed to fill out and submit to the state or whatever. And like, uh, I got already got a, you know, pile of paperwork on my desk, you know, I'll get to that when I get to that, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And, and it, it's important that there are very few things where you're going to expect a hundred percent compliance or hundred percent success. So for example, after the Columbine high school murders, there was a, and still is a very big emphasis. If you, if you see something, say something, you know, you see somebody on your social media, who's talking about doing a school shooting or you, you hear rumors about it, uh, you know, at the, the school cafeteria, don't just ignore that. Come forward and let people know about it. And that has prevented so many school shootings and mass shootings and, and other crimes. That's been really, really helpful. I mean, just in, in Colorado where we had the, uh, the Columbine school shooting in April, um, just a few weeks later, another school shooting by uh, four potential perpetrators was prevented because this time people went to the authorities and the uh, would-be criminals were stopped. That's happened many, many, many times. So that's an example of something that often does work, but not even today, not everybody uh, reports things. And the, the perpetrator um, in Uvalde, it's now coming out, had given off all kinds of dangerous warning signs, including talking about raping people and, and on, you know, on social media where he's making a written record uh, and about uh, perpetrating a school shooting and also pictured, posted pictures of, of himself uh, with tortured animals. Um, and we know from a, a mountain of data over decades that people who violently abuse animals are much more likely 
to violently abuse people. So that was a guy who could have been stopped at so many stages, uh, but in, including the stage of before he ever bought a firearm um, by doing some mental health uh, investigation and, and, and likely a psychiatric uh, hold on him as well. Yeah. Yeah. Or at the least prosecuting him uh, for the animal abuse, which might have put him in jail and he could have been in jail for animal abuse uh, and instead of out on the streets uh, uh, able to kill. Very true. Yeah. I think so often, uh, you know, it's social media has brought to the forefront, you know, this ability for anybody to say anything, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, like way more personal opinion and thoughts and ideas are put out there into, into the world than ever has been before. At the same time, there's this sort of personal disconnect. And I think, you know, we, we, a lot of times people might be inclined to see something and be like, wow, you know, that's not my problem or I don't want to get involved or, you know, there's just, it'd be different if, if I had a friend come to me face to face and personally tell me he was going to do something terrible, like, well, we're going to do something about that. But it's yeah. so easy just to turn a blind eye to something you just see online somewhere. And, you you know, you can always use the excuse, well, they're probably not serious. Or how do I know they're serious? Like, it's just some random, you know, person on, online. So, like, whatever, I'm just going to move on with my own life. Worry yeah. about and, my and, own and that's probably true, you know, and probably over nine out of ten times it is just some kind of blowhard who's, who's trying to talk big or, or get attention or whatever. But, you, you know, looking at that screen, you, you can't tell. Uh, between the person who's who's kind of just being a jerk and yapping uh, versus the one who's a, a genuine threat. And that that's why I, th I think it's appropriate uh, to let law enforcement know about it so they can investigate further. Hmm. Now, and, and again, that but that's, you know, I'm very glad we have law enforcement. I've represented law in, uh, Colorado's sheriffs and, and many, many other uh, state and national law enforcement organizations in court and, and, and they're very, very strongly supportive of, of the second amendment, but not all law enforcement is going to do the right thing either. The criminal at Parkland high school, everybody knew, he, you know, since he'd been in junior high, people were saying, this is the guy who's most likely uh, to become a school shooter reported over and over and over to law enforcement. Um, and, and the system basically did nothing with him. Um, and he, he, part of this was, it, it, it's been written about by Andrew Pollack, uh, who's the, the father of, of Meadow Pollock, who was one of the uh, students who was, was murdered at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Part of the problem was the school district had under the influence of the Obama administration, enacted this disciplinary policy, which is basically when you have crimes committed by students at school, you don't get law enforcement involved because that gets just sets up a the, what they call the school to prison pipeline. And you know, I agree that if you find some ninth graders who shoplifted a bottle of tequila. Uh, from the local liquor store, and then you catch them drinking it on campus. You don't necessarily have to call the cops over that matter. The school can take care of it as an internal disciplinary matter. But we should have had a school to prison pipeline uh, for the Parkland criminal. There were lots of ways he could have been in prison rather than uh, free uh, to do what he did. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate your you sharing your thoughts uh, on some of those uh, subjects as well. Um, you know, finding that the answers to a lot of these issues are are not simple and straightforward necessarily. Uh, there's a lot of like even when we try to break things down, we realize there's a lot of variables that play into things. I mean, talking about rising crime rates, uh, the impact that uh, uh, you know that, that guns may have on that, both on the guns that are on the streets, but also the guns that are in the pockets and pants of law-abiding armed citizens, you know, and all, all kinds of variables that you looked at. But I do want to circle back to kind of where we started with all of this. Um, 
because I think we've highlighted some issues that that show the the difficulty of further legislation, especially where there may be still things that fall through the cracks. I think one thing that uh, opened people's eyes through the riots and uh, protests of the summer of 2020, which where we saw a huge surge in gun buying across the nation, especially by first time gun buyers. And I'm convinced of, and I'd you know, certainly be open to hearing your opinion on this as well, but I'm convinced that part of the reason for a lot of that uh, motivation for, for folks to get out and maybe buy their first gun was they were seeing all these problems nationwide and many times maybe in their own cities and hearing reports of how, uh, how much uh, law enforcement was, you know, how they were occupied by such things and how long it was taking for them to respond to other issues within their jurisdictions and realizing, you know, some people realizing, realizing, I think for the first time, like it really is up to me to protect myself and my family, because if I place a call that somebody's trying to, you know, bust through my front door and it's going to be 20, 30 minutes before, or maybe never until cops can arrive at my house, like, what do I have to defend myself with, right? Uh, that's kind of my opinion anyway, is I think a lot of people felt vulnerable um, for probably the first time in, in their lives where they've up to that point felt reasonably safe, reasonably protected. Uh, oh, you know, well, I'll just, I'll just call 911 and help will be there within a few minutes time, but maybe that's not the case anymore. What are your th- thoughts on that? I, I think that, that everything you, you, you said is true. And it also started even before the riots, uh, there was the the whole pandemic thing and, you know, justified concerns. We didn't know exactly how severe it was going to be, but, you know, the possibility that, that law enforcement uh, might not be able to function as well just because so many officers uh, might be sick or, or even dying. Yeah. So there were uh, lots of good reasons why people, I think, recognize that they uh, – needed to be able to protect themselves and be their, their, their family's uh, first responder. You know, the, the thing about 911 is it's a good system, but it, it can't defy the laws of space and time. You know, e- even in the, the best, uh, and I wrote an article about this uh, for America's First Freedom a few months ago called, uh, 911 response times have gone up. Even under the the best conditions uh, in uh, big city police departments, the average response time for what's called a priority one call, you know, some real very dangerous thing uh, going on, you know, a robbery in progress or a limb. Um, e- even then, uh, the the best cities have a response time of something like over four minutes. And you look at the worst cities and their response times for those kind of things might be, you know, 11 and a half or 12 minutes. But the point is, even if it's going to be four minutes for your, your median uh, time, you know, which means half above, half below, uh, that's still four minutes where your family is vulnerable to intruders and they've got no protection other than what, what you can provide. Uh, so I'd say even in the best of times, uh, it's a, a, a very reasonable choice uh, to be able to, to choose to be uh, your family's first responder and, and protect them for those uh, several minutes until the police can come. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, completely agree. Yeah, I, I just, I, I think that uh, it's very easy as human beings to get comfortable with our our, pers- our own personal status quo, whatever that is. And because something bad's never happened to us before, or maybe it's been a long time since something bad happened, you know, we're, we just get comfortable. And like, everything's good, but you have those uh, societal level challenges presented and it can create that you know, that little something within each of us, it's like, Ooh, you know, things maybe aren't quite what I thought they were. They're not quite what they seem. Um, well, yeah. And complacency is, uh, you know, inevitable, 
but it's also a gigantic danger uh, to one's safety. You know, the, the same thing when you're driving a car. You know, you're driving a car virtually every single time. Uh, nothing happens. But you got to stay constantly alert, constantly looking at things in your peripheral vision, you know, not just looking at your speedometer and straight ahead, because uh, there, there will inevitably, of, out of the 10,000 times you drive a car, probably one or more of those is going to have something where you've got to take instant emergency action, like a child runs in front of the car or a, a car ahead uh, swerves because the driver loses control and you need to avoid that. You know, another car takes a, a flagrantly wrong and dangerous turn across the lane that you're going through. You know, all, all kinds of things can happen. So you, you, all of us have to always be fighting uh, complacency and lack of situational awareness. Excellent thoughts. Um, again, kind of coming back more full circle to where we started. 1.6 million estimated DGUs annually. And again, as you mentioned, that could be a, a variety of contexts. It could be yeah. just a drawn gun. It could be no shots fired. It could be some shots fired. It could be you know, all kinds of things, but we're, we're counting right. a lot. Of, you know, a gun was used in the course of defense and preventing or stopping a violent crime of some kind from occurring. Looking at uh, crime statistics from 2019, the FBI's UCR uh, system, 1.2 million violent crimes committed across the United States. 1.6 million DGUs estimated. It seems to me that there is a positive benefit to having an armed citizenry. Is, is, um, that, is that your take by all yeah, this? Like when you, when you yeah. get these... And, yeah. The, the National uh, Research Council, mm. uh, which, which runs a private organization, but does a lot of work with the government and runs things like the National Academies of Medicine, National Academy of Science and all that, um, has been doing a lot of work on uh, firearms social science data. And as they reported in, in 2013, Basically, virtually all of the national surveys show that defensive gun use is happens more often than use of a firearm uh, in a crime. And so, yeah, I mean, I think your, your point is, so is, is there a, a net benefit uh, from, from firearms in society? The, the answer is yes, right. although we can, we can widen that net benefit even more by working to reduce further uh, the criminals with firearms and working to increase further uh, the ability of people uh, to protect themselves in whatever place or situation uh, with a firearm. Yeah. What do you see as being the current like biggest challenges to what you just described, reducing the usage of guns by criminals while encouraging the lawful use and carrying of firearms? Uh, the biggest challenge is the the big lobbies like uh, you know which which that, you know Bloomberg and, and his uh, empire um, and and the other similar uh, billionaire supported organizations they you know in, invest huge amounts of money in politics and in politicians you know all of it legally you give direct giving to campaigns giving money to parties third, you know, third party independent expenditures, they do all that. And on a scale that, that vastly exceeds uh, what any of the pro-gun groups like the NRA or all the pro-gun groups combined um, put into elections. And so that gives them influence, understandably. And the problem with their approach is they don't believe in the, the balance of, yay, defensive gun use, let's have more, boo, criminal gun use, let's have less. They're against defensive gun use per se. I mean, not every one of their members. I'm not saying every, you know, volunteer who, you know, works with, say, uh, the Bloomberg's uh, Moms Demand group uh, thinks what I'm about to say. But but a lot, of, I've talked to many of them, and some of them, a, a good number of them do. And certainly that's the view at the top of the food chain, where Bloomberg himself, uh, who is constantly surrounded 
by very well-armed security forces, which he hired away from the New York City Police Department. <laughs> and, you know, he's, his retinue of arms is, is, is probably, uh, you know, good enough to, to uh, do a coup uh, <laughs> against a small island country. So he's constantly protected by arms. But he says, if you have a gun uh, for protection in your home and you have children, then you're stupid. And on top of that is this view that defensive gun use by individuals is immoral, that that's only something the government should do. So, for example, there was uh, in uh, not that long ago in, in Texas, a criminal came into a, a church and started doing a mass shooting. And one of the parishioners had a concealed carry permit in accordance with Texas law, drew his gun, shot the criminal, stopped him, and saved many lives. You, know, you, you think everybody ought to be happy about that. You know, <laughs> Is that something we can agree on, that that was a good result? Well, well not to Michael Bloom, Bloomberg. He actually said uh, that he was against that because that wasn't, shooting the criminal wasn't the job of the guy who shot the criminal. You know, so it, it's like only the government should have guns, should be able to use guns defensively. And I think that that's a, uh, it's a philosophical view that I disagree with. Um, and, and I think it's really, it's really wrong and, and it's dangerous. And this is, this is one of the, the problems with the anti-gun groups. If they would, they would have a lot more credibility if they could sincerely take that position most Americans agree with is that guns are good sometimes. And they'll, they'll admit, oh, guns can be okay for, for hunting or target shooting. But they are morally opposed uh, to defensive gun use um, in accordance with the law. And so they can't ever admit that's something good and that that's something that laws ought to be designed uh, to promote. Yeah. While at the same time trying to and having laws that are designed to, to reduce the gun use by the bad guys. Yeah, we really see that uh, that concept in like we see that in reality in countries like the UK or Australia, where any self defense, you know, that where lethal force might be used, it doesn't matter what the tool that's used is is basically illegal. Like if you grabbed your knife out of your kitchen drawer and, you know, try to defend yourself with that, there, there's a good chance you'd be charged with something for, for doing so. Um, that's entirely possible because they might say, well, you know, here you are a, a seven year old woman and some burglar comes in and was attacking you and you drew your kitchen knife and you stabbed him, but the burglar didn't have any weapons. So he just had fists you, the defender, used a knife, so you're the one who were escalated, and you were you're guilty of uh, not yeah. using proportionate force. You're, you're the so bad. You're the bad you have guy. Guides published by English police departments that that accurately explain the British laws as it's applied these days. You can't carry anything with the intent that you might use it uh, for self-defense. So, you know, even a hat pin. You know, is, is it legal to, to wear a hat pin in England? Yes, it is. But the moment you say to yourself, if somebody attacked me, I might use this hat pin to defend yourself, that under English law converts your hat pin into an offensive weapon, which makes you a criminal uh, for carrying it. You can't carry any non-lethal defense in, in England, for example, like a, a defensive pepper spray. Uh, so American student, exchange students who are coming over will get the lecture from the local police. If you, you brought some defensive spray, get rid of it. You can't use it. What they tell the, what the police tell people in England is if you're being raped, it is okay if you have a, you can't have a defensive spray, but you can have a, a little uh, spray paint marker, you know, that, that'll spray a dye on the, the rapist. So you know, maybe when the after the rapist leaves, uh, that'll help the police uh, find him. But they say even then, if you deliberately sprayed that marker in the rapist's eyes, that would be a crime. 
you'd be committing a crime against the rapist uh, by injuring his eyes uh, as you tried to stop him from raping you. Wow. So the idea that we are, that we have our own individual autonomy just simply doesn't exist in that world. Like ultimately we are, we may, we may think we have the illusion of, of such a thing, but ultimately where it comes to the preservation of our own lives, that, that's, that's for the government to decide. Yes. And, and in, in that way, it's a, uh, it shows how, how far England has degenerated uh, from the days when it inspired uh, the American patriots and the, for example, the, the time of the uh, English resistance to the uh, dictatorial uh, Stuart uh, mm-hmm. Kings, James II and, and Charles II and uh, philosophers like John Locke uh, wrote about how your life is a gift from God. And so therefore your body belongs to you sort of in trust for God. And you have a moral duty uh, to be able to preserve your life and your body and correlatively the the right to use uh, and, and the duty, the moral duty uh, mm-hmm. to use force to do so when when necessary. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the current English view, seem, of, at least of the English government, I don't think the people necessarily, is that, no, your, your body uh, belongs to the English government. And if uh, they'd rather uh, that you get raped rather than that the... Uh, rapist have an eye injury that's the the government's choice not yours yeah uh just i was just drawing that correlation in i guess this weird modern morality i guess of you know these uh, anti-gun groups and bloomberg and their organizations um final thing i wanted to ask you about is let's just say um we made all guns in the united states go away okay probably can't make them all go away we could wish we could wish that, but if we if we went to a mass confiscation scheme somehow, which would require I think quite a would require rewriting the Second Amendment, that's for sure. What do you think this country would look like in terms of crime? Like what what, what would that uh, turn into? Do you think down the road? Just how important, well, in other words, is this? Oh, you're, well, you're, of, you're, you're, uh, right. So we're going to hypothesize that mass confiscation. Uh, was yeah. successful and, and peaceful. So it's what, what uh, some of the uh, writers have called the, the magic magnet. Yeah. You just turn it on and all of our 400 million guns uh, get sucked up into the air and, and, and taken away like some kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, rapture scenario, and then there's no more guns. Well, then you go back to the, the world of the Middle Ages before firearms existed, and the people who have the most power are the ones who have the most physical strength. You know, so that means uh, when you have the one woman who's jogging in the park at 6 a.m. and she's confronted uh, by three male rapists, uh, if she's got a firearm, that's why they call it an equalizer. She's got a chance and the firearm uh, uniquely compared to almost other um defensive tools uh, readily allows defense at a even a substantial distance. So you take away her gun. Um, with the gun, it means the rapist has a, it, it means she's got a chance against the rapist. And if she can get it out and train it on them, uh, they'll probably go away. And without that, uh, it, it's a, a rapist uh, safety law, because uh, then the rapists just no arms, one on three on one, uh, every one of them outweighs her and is much stronger. Uh, we know what the result is going to be. It, it, so you would yeah. get rid of the, those 1.6 million annual defensive gun uses. It means obviously you, you also wouldn't have guns in the hands of criminals. It's possible to perpetrate mass murder in ways, in other ways, like by running people over with a car, uh, for example, or by uh, blowing up a building, or uh, probably easiest uh, with arson in a, in a crowded uh, building when you in the you know chain lock the exits uh, just before you, you start the fire. But you would, but the 
it's easy gets easier with a firearm than it is with with uh, with some other weapons, and it's likewise true that some criminals, like the in the, the rape scenario we just talked about, some criminals don't really need the gun, and they'd actually be much the criminals would be much better off and safer uh, in a, in a gun free environment, even with that includes them not having guns. But there there's other cases where a firearm, because of the all of the things that make it more effective, the most effective arm in a practical sense for personal defense, like the ability to project force at a distance by a weaker person, also facilitate crime. So, you know, imagine some uh, scrawny uh, 15-year-old, you know, if he walks into the uh, liquor store and says, give me all the money in your cash register or I'm going to punch you, the guy behind the counter is going to say, go ahead and try punk. And if, if the, the guy, the 15-year-old tries the He'll, he'll probably end up with a, uh, a broken nose from the, uh, uh, the clerk. But you give that 15-year-old a gun, now the 15-year-old's got the ability to control the situation. So um, imagining a world with no guns would have both positive and negative effects in terms of uh, what it would do to crime. Hmm. I find it rather interesting. Uh, you know, I've looked a little bit into... Uh, crimes committed with guns in like Australia, for instance, where supposedly, you know, they were confiscated. Uh, was that back in 1996? And, and then they had a further confiscation of several years later. Right, right. And, but yet there's uh, quite a rise in violent crime, including gun with, crime with guns committed uh, in, in Australia. Because I think if the wish list is we're going to make all guns go away, it, it, it's really not that simple. Uh, and you know, especially well, and, and not even major... Australia or or Great Britain, you know, which are yeah. islands. Yeah, you know, you think if you could have uh, imposed gun scarcity for criminals anywhere, uh, it would be there. But in in England and in Australia, the criminals who want guns can get them, in, including from uh, uh, international smugglers. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, well, and heck, in this day and age, we've got access to all kinds of technology in the form of 3d printers and right. small smaller and smaller cnc machines i mean it, it it's the cat's been let out, let out of the bag it's pretty hard to stuff that cat in the bag i think is kind of my my opinion on the matter yeah it, so. it's always been possible to make a, a crude firearm um at home by anybody who's got uh you know sort of basic machine shop skills and, and as you say uh, the the improvements in in machine tools um, in the last decades make it make that all the more accessible uh, to people. So unless we're going to also confiscate machine tools, um, it would be really hard to prevent uh, criminals from, uh, especially organized crime, um, from manufacturing their own guns. Yeah. Well, it probably seems like we wandered around a lot of different uh, various issues and topics, but I, I think it's just where we started with here today about the idea of how many armed citizen involved DGUs there are uh, typically in a given year. Um, what is the potential societal net benefit uh, because of that? And, you know, is there a moral case to be made for further and further gun control? Um, Obviously, I have a biased point of view. Yeah, but I think that that's when you when you look at some of the numbers, I think it's pretty difficult to yeah. make that case. Um, just in sheer numbers of how many people actually positively impact their own lives individually with their own personal uses of you know their own personal DGUs. Yeah, no, um, one one point six million uh, defensive gun uses is, is is a lot, and it's that's not insignificant. Yeah, no, it, it's huge, and it makes a difference to those. 1.6 million people, uh, probably directly, probably other people who were around them who might have also been victimized. And, you know, continue away. I mean, somebody who was not uh, beaten up by attackers and sent to the hospital for three weeks, that's a lot of avoided uh, social costs uh, for medical care. It means our, our medical system can, can work better because we're not dealing, uh, having to... Uh, 
provide uh, the hospitalization of whatever care is needed uh, for those 1.6 million um, victims. So, yeah. and, and it, it, it's it's something that that creates a safer society uh, more broadly. One of the if, if one of the long running differences between crime in say England and Scotland uh, or in other countries versus the United States is in the United States, most burglars work pretty hard not to go in when there's somebody there. And that's the opposite of how burglars tend to operate in some other countries. Because from the burglar's point of view, you'd actually, there's the advantage to going in when the victim is there is they have their purses and wallets there so you can get cash. And cash is the best thing for a burglar to steal because any property you steal, you've got to fence it. And, you know, probably for somebody who knows they're buying stolen goods. And so it means you sell the property at a discount to its actual retail value. Um, but with cash, you get 100%. You know, the value of the uh, $400 you took from somebody's wallet is exactly $400. Um, and that's why in England, they do prefer to break in uh, when the victims are home. And they don't do it in the United States because as the studies of burglars themselves have said, we're afraid of getting shot. You know, that the, the, the longest part of an American burglar's working day is, uh, as they say, casing the joint, observing the building they want to enter to try to make sure that it's un unoccupied uh, when they go in because it's just too dangerous for them. And in fact, plenty of burglars, and the statistics bear this out, uh, that a burglar's risk of getting shot by going into an occupied home exceeds the risk of ever going to prison. So if you think that prison plays some deterrent role um, on burglary, uh, defensive gun use ownership in the home uh, plays an even larger one. So that it's a uh, it, it's also something where there's a, a large free rider effect because not every American home has a gun, but unless you put up a sticker saying this is a gun-free home on your, your window, uh, the burglar doesn't know that. And so the, the homes that don't own guns get a free rider uh, benefit uh, of reduced, substantially reduced home invasion risks, uh, thanks to the their neighbors who do own firearms. Yeah. Excellent thoughts. I, I've kept you probably longer than I should have. Uh, Dave, we really appreciate your time here today sharing with us your thoughts on these, these issues. Uh, where can folks find you online? Go to my website, davecopel.org, D-A-V-E-K-O-P-E-L.org. And I'm also on Twitter uh, at, at Dave Copel, D-A-V-E-K-O-P-E-L. And I'll just say from having, uh, you know, perused his website a number of times, it's an excellent place for resources on a variety of topics, not just firearms, but uh, freedom in general, uh, stuff that's going on in the courts and Congress. Lots of really great info on Dave's website. So uh, any final words or anything else you want to get out there, Dave? No, I, I think we're set. And we just need to, even though the uh, the gun ban lobbies won't like what we do, we need to just keep on doing what is appropriate for making, uh, strengthening uh, public safety, which is promote gun ownership by responsible people and keep guns out of, do our best uh, to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. Awesome. Great summary. And again, we thank you for your time. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up, folks. Uh, just a reminder that our sponsors today were CCW Safe at ccwsafe.com, uh, the Guardian Conference, guardianconference.com, and Mountain City Supply Ammunition at mountaincitysupply.com. Folks, hope you enjoyed this one today. We appreciate Dave for giving of his time so generously. And until next time, folks, a reminder to train right, train often, and train safe so you can fight hard, fight fast, and fight true. Take care.